Bienvenue au Dialogue Massey. Welcome to Massey Dialogues. It's wonderful to have you here. Today we're talking about 10 years ago, during the meeting of the G20 in Toronto, largest mass arrest in the city of, in Canada. And we're going to talk a little bit about the past, the present and the future of the right to protest. So I'm uh, delighted that uh, we are at Massey. Massey is a place for ideas. It as a, its mission is to nourish learning and serve the public good. And the physical college of Massey is located on indigenous land, the land of the Huron Wanda, the Seneca, and the Mississauga as of the credit. We are grateful for the ability to continue to do our work here. So let me introduce our guest. Uh, first, I'll have Kara Zweibel. Kara was a, a colleague of mine at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association 10 years ago. She is the Director of Fundamental Freedoms, uh, and she is her work focuses on uh, freedom of religion, uh, the right to protest, democratic rights. She was called to the bar in 2005. She has a political science degree from McGill, a law degree from Osgoode Hall Law School, and as well as a LLM from York University. From New York University. Uh, her work at CCLA involves drafting opinion and, and, and involves also uh, arguing cases at times and certainly being fully engaged in public education. So I want to welcome her. It's a delight to have her here. Uh, after that, we're going to hear from uh, Mary Klippenstein, who's practiced in a public interest field for over 30 years. I, I don't want to uh, mention that, but I think, uh, you know, uh, we've, you, we've been around for a long time, uh, you and I. Uh, so uh, it's been representing clients and organizations in indigenous law, environmental law, civil rights, affordable housing, international human rights is for many re years as represented an indigenous Cree tribal council in the far north and has been really active in groundbreaking international human rights lawsuit against a Canadian mining uh, company. He's been really quite active on this file as well, on the file of the right to protest. And he, was, he currently co-leads uh, litigation for a class action for approximately a thousand protesters and citizens who were detained 10 years ago during the G20 meetings in Toronto. He's received many awards for his great work and it's really an honor to have you here, Murray. Thank you. And finally, we'll hear from uh, uh, Basil uh, uh, Alexander, who is assistant professor at the Faculty of Law at the University of New Brunswick. He has a Bachelor of Arts and Science from McMaster, a Bachelor of Laws and Master of Public Administration from the University of Victoria, a Master of Laws from University of Toronto. And during his law school, he worked for judges in the Nunavut Court of Justice and uh, many indigenous issues as well. His current work is focuses on Canadian cause lowering. And I think we'll hear a little bit of what that, that means. And he's also was uh, uh, participated when he was in law and practice as a team member during the Ypres Wash inquiry. You will all remember it was the, the estate of Dudley George who had been killed by the police and uh, his family were uh, suing at the time and so he was also involved in the early stages of, of the class action for the G20 mass arrest. So let's start a little bit about what was happening 10 years ago. Kara, maybe you could uh, uh, bring us back to, uh, to that time. We had uh, volunteers at the CCLA, some of them were arrested as well. Maybe you could just describe a little bit the scene, your souvenirs, your take on what happened 10 years ago. Yeah, so I, um, it was an interesting time because I think I'd been at CCLA for only about a, a month or so before the G20 happened. And of course, there was a lot of work that uh, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association did leading up to the summit to try and, you know, raise concerns about things we were hearing, to talk about the fact that police planned to erect this big security perimeter around where the meeting would be taking place, that um, people might be, um, people were being told they might be subject to, you know, stops and searches if they were getting too close to the summit area. Police were encouraging people to protest in a sort of designated free speech zone. And of course, our response was that that's all of Canada. Canada is a free speech zone. So um, there was a, 
you know, there was a, a lot of, I think, anticipation um, and and concerns that we raised going in. Um, and unfortunately, it proved uh, to be necessary to be raising those concerns. And, um, you know, the police response, um, it, it resulted in these mass arrests um, of peaceful protesters, of, you know, bystanders, people who are just uh, often just in the neighborhood walking by. Um, we had people in detention centers denied access to, to counsel. Um, I think probably the the low point for me was when we um, we had a first year law student who was uh, volunteering with us for the summer and was out as a human rights monitor. And um, when I had to call his father to say that his son was in the detention center, that's that's that was the low point, I think. Um, and um, and I think it was surprising to people that this could happen in Canada, that um, you know that that people could be arrested for. Um, engaging in peaceful protests, that they could be held in a detention center. Um, we were, you know, certainly seeing some instances of police talking about, um, you know, the charter doesn't apply during the G20, or there's some, um, those aren't your rights today. So um, I think it was a scary time, but also um, there, there have been a lot, there was a lot of examination of that, those events that took place after the fact. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting to kind of think about what, if anything was learned from that and looking forward, you know, how, how have things changed and evolved? I think a, a lot of lessons uh, came out that were, um, it, it took some time for those lessons to come out. We had, you know, a review, we at the CCLA did a lot of work. We, um, invited people to to um, come tell their stories. Um, the Ontario Ombudsman did a report. The Office of the Independent Police Review Director did a report. So there's a there is a number of mechanisms that that took place, but that all happened sort of after the the worst of it was over. So and I remember there was this very controversial technique called kettling that the police used, where they would just circle a group of people whether they were protesting or protesting or not, they were just happened to be there. And then the, the police would move uh, closer and closer and people were getting tighter together and there was only one way to get out and then they would be arrested as they, they, they got out of this kettling. Uh, I think, if I recall, I think now uh, eventually the police decided that they would no longer use kettling. Is that your... I, I think so, although I'm not sure if it's, uh, I, I think there was a particular police force that said they wouldn't do that, but I don't think it's the case that that everyone is on the same page there, right? Obviously, um, the G20 did involve multiple sort of layers of police, the RCMP at a certain level, the OPP had a certain role, and then there were Toronto police officers, but also some officers from other jurisdictions who were who were brought in just because of how, how large the event was. Mm -hmm. um, and there is still, I think, a lot of variation. You know, even more recently, we've seen with some of the the anti-black racism protests that, for the most part, there have been um, those have been peaceful, and um, there hasn't been a a, a negative police response. Um, but there have been in Quebec, um, Montreal is often the place where police and protesters seem to clash the most, and that mm -hmm. that was true of of those protests as well. Because since uh, the G20. There's been, uh, there was the Occupy movement, uh, then there was uh, indigenous uh, uh, protests that have been going on that, and that were recurring recently about the, the, the pipeline. Uh, so the, it's important that their right to protest continues to be vibrant because as we used to say, I mean, you know, rich people have their, their lobbyists, but poor people have their feet and they won't be heard until, until they, they take to the street. Let's bring in Murray here because uh, Murray has been uh, in this business for a long time. Now you, uh, you've been representing uh, uh, indigenous uh, groups. You've also been representing the, the large number of people that were arrested uh, uh, during the G20. Uh, anything that you can say about the the current situation about the right to protest? Yeah, thank you, Natalie, and uh, and, and my fellow panelists, uh, an esteemed bunch. Uh, it's been ten years, um, and um, we started a class action uh, shortly after the G20, and that's still ongoing. Uh, ten years later, 
and um, we benefited from assistance of the CCLA back then, um, which we appreciated in a, uh, some preliminary motions. And uh, in fact, Natalie, you uh, you did a major affidavit uh, in support of parts of it. So I, uh, we're still grateful for everything the organization has done. I looked at the affidavit today; it had 61 exhibits. <laughs> so we were grateful for your time and assistance. Um, um, the class action has two class representatives, uh, uh, Sherry Good and Tommy Taylor, and they may, may be watching uh, today, uh, perhaps. And uh, one of the many uh, hidden parts of a class action like this is the two class representatives have been with us for 10 years. So it's almost like a part of the family. Um, and it's an achievement and quite on their part that class reps can maintain the dedication for 10 years. Now, um, I'll say a bit about what's happened in those 10 years, but where are we now? Um, I have to be a bit careful because uh, um, well, of, of, of privilege and confidentiality, but let me say these generalities. Um, in big litigation cases like this, it is very common for uh, at some point uh, discussions to occur, occur about possible resolution of the case, mm -hmm. and that has happened in this case. Uh, I don't think that's breaching confidentiality to say something as plain as that. And the second thing I'll say is, um, uh, personally, uh, I'm optimistic that there will be some good news in due course uh, out of this. And uh, so that's all I'll say right now. I wish I could say more. I wish I could give more details. Uh, but um, things are going well in the case. It has been one heck of a, a journey. Um, the class action, as, as you may know, requires in, in Ontario that a court actually certify or approve the class action uh, before it can proceed as a class action. Um, that requires major effort at the first step of evidence and argument for the court. And we actually had a seven day argument before the court back in uh, 2012 and 2013. And uh, the judge at the first level said no. Um, so we had to appeal that, and we eventually went through three, three levels of appeal up to the Supreme Court of Canada to confirm that we could be certified, in other words, to get to first base or to get to the starting point. Um, and that only happened at the end of 2016 to confirm certification. So that is part of the bigger picture of the difficulty of, of cases like this. And, 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 and so one could ask, is it worth it or what's the point? And I know the Civil Liberties Association has a long history of, of giving a major role to, to courts as... Uh, as affirming basic rights and even even sort of extending basic rights. Um, so and personally, I, I believe that the, the courts have a role and in big cases like this, it sometimes takes 10 or 15 years. Um, mm -hmm. if, if this were to head to a trial, the trial could be perhaps 100 days of court time. There'd be, you know, scores, hundreds of witnesses, tens of thousands of documents, audio tapes, videotapes. It's staggering. Um, you know, uh, perhaps we may not uh, have to go there. So but what's the, the strategy, like the, the strategy of using a class action? action wh why is it that it's important uh, that these steps be taken uh, in terms of the public good? That, that's a very good question, because sometimes um, it doesn't make sense to do a class action. Um, sometimes people sort of jump to the class action idea. Um, but, uh, for example, in another uh, case arising from G20 uh, for a gentleman named Paul Figueres, who was a, an animal rights protester just walking down the street, mm -hmm. uh, was stopped by police and said, we want to search. And um, uh, he politely refused. And we said he had a right to walk down the sidewalk unmolested. It's a basic Canadian right. Um, and uh, uh, we took that to court, uh, lost the first round, won at the Court of Appeal in a, in a quite a good decision, mm -hmm. which affirmed the right to walk down the street unmolested. Now, that was the case of one particular individual, not a class action, and that was deliberate because sometimes, and in that case, we sought a declaration, but as you know, if you get a declaration, it applies to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, in the G20 case, there was a, about, well, over a thousand people who were either mass arrested in a group on the street uh, or held in this awful, awful inhumane detention center, the temporary jail, or both. Mm -hmm. And um, we decided that it was, um, uh, it, it whole needed, needed, we needed to claim compensation and justice for everybody. Um, yeah. So that was a different strategy. And by the way, I would be remiss if I didn't express appreciation to 
Basil, who on both those cases had an important role uh, uh, ongoing. I don't want to go as far as to say we, we wouldn't have got where we are without him, but I'll go almost that far. <laughs> well, let's, let's bring Basil in there. So that's uh, so you've worked uh, on these cases initially, and now you are uh, teaching law. And, and uh, so what's your take on the future a little bit of, of uh, the right to protest, and what concerns you? Well, there's a lot that does because the reality is, is these issues keep coming up. Uh, and like the one thing that came up for me was when I started hearing stories about the G20, I wasn't in Toronto at the time. I was actually in Ottawa uh, at a, attending a friend's wedding whose date is now burned into my head. Uh, <laughs> what ended up happening was I started hearing uh, deja vu of what had happened at April Wash in terms of some of the stuff that had gone on in the issues. Very different contexts, very different things that were at play but it reinforced the reality of these things keep coming up. And it's the reality of how does society actually want and should deal with protests and where it goes for and what's the point of protests when it's all going on. It's this interesting thing of it seems to come up every 10 to 15 years and it's one of the interesting things that's coming up out of the anti-black uh, racism and the Black Lives Matter stuff that's been coming up lately is the actual question of what is the police interaction and what are the things that are going on. Uh, and, you know, part of the problem, like, don't get me wrong, the litigation is very good. It helps to set the stuff going forward. But the issue is, is that all this stuff happens after the fact. So while it's going on on the ground, there's so much that is left to what happens to the police discretion at the particular point. And the question is, is what do we actually do with that going forward? So this is kind of the question of what exactly is involved in the right to protest or it, under the charter, a right to the freedom of peaceful assembly. What does that actually involve? And it's actually been under litigated in Canada. Yes. Out of all the freedoms, it's the one that is has the least amount of case law on it. When it's talked about, it's usually talked about under a freedom of expression uh, characterization. And that doesn't quite fit right, is my argument. You think, what actually is the core? Like, it, it's about how society can express dissent. And we can argue about like the nuances of the law and why that is and all those other things that come in there. But it is that question of how do we preserve a right for expressing dissent when you don't have other ways to do it that just aren't coming through. And I think that's something that keep, that's going to keep coming up because uh, it's an interesting thing that as society evolves, new issues keep coming forward. We're never going to be perfect. Right? There's always a new standard, there's new stuff that comes up, there's new conceptions of justice, and it's the question of what exactly is the things and how do we deal with this in a going forward matter, which is something I think we need to think about um, and try to figure out what, how this works. So it's, it's fascinating because you're right, uh, whether it was uh, 10 years ago, whether it was the, the Printemps Arabe, the student protests in Quebec, whether it's the indigenous uh, uh, protests that exist, the, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter protest. So there's a, there's a concern that uh, whether the public, it's it's trying to manipulate, try to get the attention and the affection of the public when you're protesting. You want the public to support what you're saying. Uh, but there are people that tend to have a negative view of, of protest. Is there a way out? Is that is that what it's all about? It's just kind of uh, it's not really about the right, it's about the, 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 the images that, that make the protest. Well, I always take a practical view on this, right? So it's the question of what is the best way to achieve social change? Sometimes that's through litigation, often it's not. It's what, what is the best use of your resources? Can you get other people to agree to this? And this sort of ties into cause lawyering, right? Like it's all that question of litigation sometimes is your answer, Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not, depending on the resources that are going on, right, and all the issues that are at play. And it's the, how do you actually achieve lasting social change? Uh, and, you know, the, this is this is part of the issue of that's coming up with the anti-Black racism discussions and the Black Lives Matter stuff that's going on in terms of, for example, how do you police, right? Is that something that's actually legal or is that something that is policy reform? something about the other stuff that's going on as to what are the roles and the broader things that are at play in order to make this going on? Law sometimes isn't always the best answer for that. Sometimes you got to look at other ways to do that. So let's bring in everyone together here because the, typically uh, in every protest, there's always this uh, idea of what's the response, the appropriate response from the police, you know? And uh, 
you know, are they are they overly armed? Do they does the fact that they come fully armored uh, incite or kind of precipitate stronger action? Uh, but I think you know it'd be interesting to have just a little bit of a, a roundtable about what what do you think is the problem? Is it bad training? Is it that uh, 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 policing, or is it that there's just too much discretion and and people just kind of panic and and that's how it is? Or any uh, any views on that? Let's start with uh, with Kara. Sure. So I mean I think it, it's. I, I don't want to minimize the extent to which I think um, police have a difficult job when it comes to policing protests. And I've, I've gone to speak to police officers about, you know, about rights respecting policing of protests and how how that's done. But I always acknowledge right at the outset that, you know, I've never actually done this myself. I, I don't I don't know what it's like to be on the front lines. I do think that when police show up, you know, heavily armed or when they're when they show up in the riot gear, that that does um, send a message, whether it's intentional or not. I mean, the same way that police, you know, during the G20, there was this idea that if you were a protester and you had a bandana or you had anything that was intended to, um, I guess, what, what the police would characterize as um, sort of circumvent right any crowd control weapons. So something that would protect you if tear gas were deployed. Um, the the assumption was you, you're carrying that because you're going to cause some trouble. And this, it's not a true assumption, but the same assumption goes the other way, that if you see police in riot gear, you expect that they're they're prepared to, you know, to use it. So I think I think it is a problem. I think police have to have the discretion that that they do have. Um, but but certainly it has to be, um, you know, put in a framework where um there are certain things that are off the table. Um, there are certain things that police can't do. And I, I think, you know, we've seen a bit of both um, sides in terms of how the public reacts, because there's the response to something like the G20, where people feel that the police have completely, you know, overreacted and responded in a way that's disproportionate. And then we saw with some of the um, Indigenous rail blockades in support of the Wet'suwet'en um, chiefs that, many people were saying, you know, why aren't police enforcing the law? There's an injunction or people are on the tracks. That's illegal. Let's get them off. So um, I, I, I do feel that, you know, police are in a difficult situation. And I think one of the important things to understand about a situation like, um, like choosing not to remove uh, mm -hmm. a rail blockade is that police are making an assessment that, you know, the, the harm of doing so, the potential yeah. for another ipper wash, um, outweighs the harm that's happening by a blockade. So in a way you're saying we should be able as a society to accept disruptions, uh, that that it's part of a democracy that when pe that uh, there will be some protest and that's a healthy features. So uh, what do you think, uh, Murray, are, are people accept that or is that is that always behind the scene that they want to get to work, they want to get to market, they want to get to and, and that therefore there's almost a, a way in which let's precipitate an event to justify uh, the police go going in. Have you seen that in your in your work? Well, let, let me uh, refer to the uh, results of the Ipperwash incident as we were just talking about uh, different, uh, and, and Basil was talking about the long-term effects, and I bon by no means uh, argue that litigation is the answer to everything, um, but um, in the Ipperwash situation, um, the uh, the family, and, and uh, both Basil and I were closely on, on that case through, uh, what, eight years of litigation, and then a judicial public inquiry, which delivered a major report. Mm -hmm. That report, which came out in something like 2006, was far-reaching and had, I think, a deep effect in many police forces. And so six months ago, when we had Indigenous people blockading national railways, and there were a lot of people saying, I want to get to work, I need to ship my goods, the police carefully managed it, and lots of them referred to the Ipperwash inquiry. So in terms of uh, long-term approach to situations, I'm quite amazed, I think, that... Uh, uh, you know, what happened in Ipperwash taught some lessons which went very far into the organizations and have some beneficial effect. On the other side, very quickly, uh, 
uh, you know, litigation cases uh, like the, the Paul Figueres case, it was deliberately my and our intention to set a legal precedent. And when yeah. you set a legal precedent, it stands for, you know, 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I said to my colleagues and myself, I want to set a law which will uh, put a marker in the ground that will preserve civil rights for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that all police officers sit down and read the Figueres decision. I think they really should, but I think it does have an effect. And, and similarly, the, the G20 class action, uh, you know, as I say, I'm optimistic that there will be good results. And one thing we insisted on was not only comp financial compensation for protesters, we wanted to go further and said there need to be commitments to do things differently in the future. So what about you, Basil? This, in, in your work, like, there's a, also an international dimension to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the right to protest, because uh, throughout we see that uh, police forces develop and techniques and tactics that are shared uh, internationally. There are weapons. Uh, when we were at the, the G20, we, uh, we took action on the use of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the sound cannon, cannon. The, yeah. the sound cannon, uh, that long range acoustic device as it, 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 it was called. Uh, so, so there's a technique, uh, there are instruments, uh, and there's this non-lethal weapons, uh, tasers, batons, and, and so on. Is there enough, do we know enough about how they are displayed, whether we, there's enough transparency about what are the rules of, of, of surrounding these, these, the use of these techniques or instruments? Well, I think that's part of the question, but I think the issue is actually more fundamental than that. I think the question is, what's the role of police and what ought to be the role of police in our society as we work through things? Uh, the biggest question and the biggest issue, like part of what you're talking about is uh, kind of what's happened is over the last 20 to 30 years is the development of kind of a dual role of policing where you try to, where there's some negotiation on one side, but then you have the militarization aspects that you talked about that's happening on the other. And what is really the question, but really the question is, is how, like, how do you humanize and how do you actually deal with the people that you're dealing with in terms of dealing with it, particularly since police are dealing with so much more today than they probably should be dealing with compared to what they dealt with in the past. So it's, you know, it, it, it's this question of what exactly is the role and how do you focus it and how do you focus the question? Because the focus is, and what are the considerations that come into it? One of the things that I think is most valuable out of April Wash that talks about, it talked about Aboriginal policing, but I think a lot of the concepts are applicable in other concepts as well, is the idea of keeping the peace fundamentally when you're dealing with a protest on the ground. Like that's really what it comes down to. And then if you use that as kind of a framework, you can then deal with the rest going forward as to what it is. So it's changing the thinking and the mentality and getting away from an us versus them, if you can do that, and actually start talking and dealing with the issues and trying to do some movement in order to move that forward and recognizing the tough role people are in. Uh, but it, because they're often the ones who have to deal with the flashpoint or the flare-up that happens when a catalyst happens and then they're the ones who have to deal with what comes from that. And, you know, that, that's part of the problem. And, you know, it's also the question of what are the tactics and everything else that comes out of that as to are we, are we training people too much down one road? And the one thing that always reminds me of the G20 that, that kind of made me laugh is out of all the prep slides for, and I'm using this as an example and I'm hoping things have changed since then. Um, there was one slide about uh, freedom of assembly and the right to protest in their prep. The rest was about tactics and techniques and the rest of the material that's there. So this is the question of where exactly do you put the focus and emphasis in order to make this work? and actually change what you should do and what's the rule and what people are actually trying to do through this. So let's, if we're all together there, I'd like to have another uh, round uh, a little bit about, uh, many people are talking about defunding the police uh, uh, as, a, as a solution to the excesses of force, uh, to, to uh, both on the way in which it deals with mental health uh, visits, uh, the way it deals with uh, arrest or law enforcement, and also the way it dealt with, uh, with uh, policing protest. What's your view uh, on this? Uh, let's start with you, Basil. Um, I think it's worth discussing, and I think this is the question of 
um, you know, what we're talking about is this goes to the fundamental question of what is the role of police and what should they be doing and what ought they be doing. Uh, and I think that's the question. So should we be investing strictly in more militarization or should we be looking at investing in dealing with some of the systemic issues, which actually may help deal with a lot of this and move society forward as a whole. So, you know, I think those are discussions that we need to be having rather than just assuming that uh, that we're, that without the resources that and dealing with the underlying issues that you don't get there. Indigenous issues are the classic ones, right? It's mm -hmm. always about the land. Um, if you don't deal with the land, you don't deal with the underlying issue. Um, so we got to start dealing with the tough questions, which are the underlying ones, and defunding the police may be one of those uh, ways of do we reallocate resources and trying to understand can we deal with the systemic stuff and what is actually the proper role of police as a result. So what about you, Kara? Uh, any, uh, any views on the defunding of the police? Is that... Uh, uh, What's the, what's the view? As I don't think CCLE has come out one way or the other, have you? Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we've done some, we have done some talking about this. And I think, you know, um, although the, the label defunding the police is sort of a, a short form, right, we are talking about reallocating resources and changing the role. Um, and I think we do think that's a really valuable conversation to have. Um, I think, you know, some of the issues that come up in these protests where you see and I think this has probably been more obvious in the anti-Black racism protests that we've seen in the United States, is that um, when you have police in all of these different roles and their interactions with the community are so charged and tense, um, it's not surprising that when it comes to the policing of protests, things sort of explode. Um, so I think that, um, you know, if we did have police in different roles, that they're... Um, they would be able to more easily sort of function effectively as we'd want them to during protests. Um, you know, I think during the G20, I think one of the interesting sort of phenomena that happened was that the protests started off as being about, you know, various issues that the summit leaders were talking about, about the economy and, you know, uh, the environment. Um, but by day two, they were pretty much all about the police. Um, they were all about how the police were, were responding to protests. So, you know, I think that, that those things are definitely related. And um, the conversation about what, what, you know, what is the proper role of the police and, um, um, and also diverting resources to, you know, to other areas that can deal better with things like mental health issues, things like, you know, addiction, um, Will, will have beneficial sort of knock-on effects for, for how police protest, mm -hmm. how, how police protest, how police police protest, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, so, and, and Murray, like, let's, so what's the, what's the next big case on this that you would like to, to take, you know, what's, what's the new landmark that you want to establish to uh, ensure the, for 20 years, a good protection of, of uh, civil liberties or the right to protest. What are the areas where there still needs uh, uh, clarifications from, from the legal side? Well, I have, I have some thoughts on that. I, I don't know if I should talk about it because it might be a bit controversial, but let me, let me go back to, uh, to defunding the police. It's, uh, I'll just say uh, sort of intuitively, uh, I know defund the police is a, is a phrase that is a slogan that is intended to raise some questions, but I think it's, uh, you know, on its face, it's a bonkers idea. And I think, uh, you know, 80, 90 percent of the population out there would think that's just crazy. Um, and um, it is a useful slogan for for something. And I don't deny that. I was actually chatting with a police officer outside the uh, my office today on the on the sidewalk because I chat with people. I talk to them about all sorts of things, including G20. And I told him, I'm suing you guys in a class action. And we had a real nice time talking about it you know, human to human and, and get, uh, getting his perspective and talking about what's what's happening now, uh, you know, with the police movement. And, uh, uh, you know, he, he said, you know, so many people come up to him and say, thanks for what you're doing. Now, in, in G20 particularly, mm -hmm. um, one of the themes that the police lawyers constantly raised throughout, and it had an effect, and they had lots of evidence, 
is that there were many protesters or some protesters who deliberately merged in the peaceful protest yeah. and changed yeah. into, into black bloc garb and went out and smashed uh, bank windows. Mm -hmm. And whatever you think of the bigger picture politics of that, um, that was for real. And one of the issues uh, at every step of the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada was the police arguing that uh, it was not a suitable class action because there was this mixture in there. So we, we had to deal with that. And, and, and that was a reality. We cannot deny it. And how do you deal with this? Uh, how do you deal that uh, they could be uh, uh, infiltrators, both there to create trouble, uh, and sometimes uh, we had occasion to see that some police officers were, uh, you know, going under uh, and trying to create trouble so that it would flare up and therefore there would be a public appetite for a stronger and more muscled intervention. So how did you deal with it in your in your class actions with this? Well, it, it's a very interesting question. I mean, for example, people often think in these situations, uh, you know, we lawyers should jump up and down and show charter rights, charter rights. We argued charter rights, but we argued something else strategically, which was actually the winning argument uh, on the certification issue, which is We said there is an old principle in common law from 200 years ago that says in order to arrest somebody, people need to have a, a reason to believe that that particular person committed a crime, which means you can't arrest a group. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, that is a sort of a basic, simple principle of law that law students learn in the first year. And in a way, it's not glamorous, but that is what got us certified because mm -hmm. you can't arrest a group like that. Mm -hmm. And the police would say, in that group, we had good reason to believe there were some people who would smash bank windows. Well, that's not an answer. So mm -hmm. the, the point is, it's a funny thing how these, you know, specific doctrines of law, which are obscure and old and not glamorous, can have a big, big role. But let's uh, let's bring in everybody here, because I think it's interesting to think about that, that the idea that, Uh, uh, you know, an old principle which says, you know, you need to have evidence about that individuals. And I remember where, when uh, uh, the example was, well, if you think somebody has committed a crime and is in an apartment building, you don't arrest everybody by saying, oh, well, they, if I arrest everybody, I'm sure I'm going to get that person. That's not our, our system. But in times of emergency, and I think COVID is an emergency, uh, as uh, and, and The police, in the context of um, policing protest, often see themselves in the, it's an emergency. It's uh, we need to react quickly, and they want to kind of chip away at at old principles like this. Do you worry that uh, after COVID or because of COVID, we are more likely to accept that the uh, old principles of law need to be put aside? for the greater good of protection of uh, public safety, protection, uh, that's what that was during the terrorism area or public health uh, nowadays. Did, did you see anything differently? Uh, Basil, uh, your comments on this. This is a little bit the future about whether the, the atmosphere of the public has changed. Well, it's interesting because I think COVID has done two things, right? I think you've raised the one side of the sword in terms of the question of, is this going to make it easier in order to restrict it? But I think the question is, how long does the COVID-19 restrictions last? And I think this is the thing that what we're seeing now is it's lightening up across the country and what now happens as a result uh, as we go through that. The flip side of it is what COVID-19 has shown also is that change can be done and is possible mm -hmm. uh, in a very short time in the right context when there's resources and there's a political will and other things to do that. The question is, is whether or not you can create that context to do it and can you find the incentives and the people to buy in to actually make that work, right? And I think that's kind of like, this is the nature of it, right? Like law is a reflection of society, society is a reflection of law. Mm -hmm. And it is this question of how do you make the two and what are the opportunities and what is the reflection that we're dealing with now in order to make that go. So I think time will tell. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's something we're going to have to wait and see. I'm not sure that's just a COVID issue. I think that deals with just gen generally 
we're in an area where we are in the digital age, where it's not the same as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago in terms of what information for each of us is out there. We're dealing with the realities of uh, artificial intelligence and, that, and the data mining that can be done and what the information that can, can come from that. Society always adapts and changes. And the question is, how do we do that? And what do we view as a society as the core things that we want to keep and that we want to keep doing as we go forward? So I think that's something we're going to have to watch and see and adjust on the fly. And, and, you know, this is stuff that I work on, the CCLA works on, litigators like Murray work on. It, it's something that's kind of the thing of, you kind of see what's the things that are going on and, and we all do the best we can based on what's going on. So, Kara, when, what's on the, uh, the agenda for CCLA? What do they watch you if, if there's going to be a protest next week? What, how do you, what are you, the thing that you're looking at to see whether it's going to be done in a lawful way uh, uh, or not? So, I mean, we're always looking, I think, at, at how the police respond. And obviously in some, you know, there are some instances where um, the group protesting has a relationship with the police or, um, you know, they actually are are quite happy to work together. And there are lots of events like that where, you know, protesters uh, organize with police, police know what to expect. Um, this is the idea of sort of um, minimizing, I guess, the disruption that a protest can cause while still, I guess, causing enough disruption that it gets the attention that, that protesters are looking for. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, the interesting thing that I think the COVID um, crisis is showing, um, and I am very worried about, um, and I think the CCLA as an organization is very worried about um, the privacy, privacy, but also the, the, I mean, the the significant restrictions on liberty that people have been uh, willing to accept. Um, not so much right at the outset, where I think a lot was unknown, but this idea that many people seem quite prepared to accept restrictions on their liberty for a very long time mm -hmm. um, in the name of, you know, what if you if you look at at the numbers and the science um, is uh, is maybe not as dangerous as we initially saw. And I don't want to minimize the danger, but I do think there's been a, a shift in the narrative around, um, you know, at, initially the focus was really on ensuring that we had capacity in the healthcare system and things have somewhere along the line shifted a bit so that we're, we're you know, we're fighting the virus, we're trying to eliminate the virus, uh, which which seems to be a losing battle um, from, from what the scientists say. So I worry about that, but I think it, it also has shown um, in terms of relevance to protests that um, we can take a lot of disruption. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're prepared to put up with quite a lot of disruption in our lives uh, for things that are important to us, things like our health and safety, um, and that protesters when they're exercising their right to protest are are asking people to put up with that disruption as well for something that they um, feel needs that attention so that it's it's that capacity that capacity of, of the public to recognize that it's uh, you don't have a democracy if you're not prepared to have some disruptions yeah. uh, so that people feel a sense that they can have a voice they yeah, won't change exactly unless right. people can express themselves yeah uh, I know that uh, uh, we're also looking, uh, when we're looking at the future of the right to protest, we're looking at uh, not only training of the police, we're looking at, is there some good lessons to tell the people that are organizing protests? Is there uh, something in, in that needs to be uh, developed there? Are there good techniques uh, on the protester side? I remember that th there were lots of people thinking about what does it mean uh, to to validate and to support uh, a good right to protest? Murray, any any thoughts on this? Uh, lessons for organizers. Um, well, it's um, um, you you have to remember, and I, I say this analytically, not critically, that as part of the right to protest, um, you get close to some edges. And as in G20, there are a variety of people who, uh, for reasons they think are well justified at a deep level, uh, intent on breaking the law, intent on causing damage. Uh, I saw on TV in one protest a couple of days ago, uh, somebody said, in order to reform the system, you have to destroy it. 
And uh, people are tearing down statues now in the U.S., which is clearly illegal. And again, I'm speaking analytically, not, not necessarily critically. But in the protests, this, these things get mixed together. So you get dragged right to the edge of a lot of things. And if you're an organizer, um, for all I know, you may support that, and I, you know, or, or uh, so it, it is, um, you know, a protest doesn't necessarily follow rules that the organizers set out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. there you go. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, and part of it is, is the, uh, the experience of not being alone saying the same message. And, and in a way, my sense, and I want to hear you all a little bit on this, uh, the right to protest is, is the epitome of the collective right, uh, it, it, because it only exists because you're, uh, you're doing it on group. The peaceful assembly is you're going to be more than one person. So uh, have we more trouble to, to uh, conceptualize and analyze and reflect collective rights? generally because of the uh, the the framework of uh, civil liberties that was so focused on individual uh, rights for so long uh, that uh, we are struggling with how to uh, understand the, the collective bargaining we're starting to uh, we have trouble to understand freedom of association and now uh, the right to protest and and eventually i think even at times, equality uh, as a collective r- right is is being challenged. Uh, Basil, I'd like to hear from you since you're you know you're the thinker and you're writing your PhD now. What and I also want you to answer what does cause lowering mean so f- for the average person to understand that. Well, I think that'll also answer your question about you know what is the question that organizers need to do. So there's a lot there to try to unpack and do. So I'll try to do it in turn. Um, it, it's the question of, I think collective rights are the next thing that's coming down the pipe uh, in order to deal with this. And I, I think the reality is association and uh, peaceful assembly have always been connected. In other countries, they are much more connected than they are here uh, because association is actually something that has, in a, in a basic sense of getting together into groups is something that's been prohibited. Whereas in Canada to date, that hasn't been too much of an issue. But the court, Supreme Court, has very clearly said uh, collective rights are there under the under both the under both peaceful assembly and association. That's something. The question of the content is, I think, something that needs to be worked out and thought as to where it goes. So when this comes to cause lawyers, what that really is, in the way I approach it, is how do lawyers work with causes to support? How do lawyers support social change? And that can be in a variety of ways. So it can be the question of, are you a litigator? Are you working within an organization like Kara is with the CCLA? Are you an academic who's helping from other ways? Uh, Are you uh, working in a legal clinic and bringing test cases? Are you somebody who is doing the policy reform? And the question is, what's the best thing to do for you and your circumstances and where it goes? I think that's the question for litigators. Mm -hmm. Sorry, for organizers. Um, What exactly do you want to accomplish and what's the best way for you to go there? and understand the consequences of if you go this route, here's where it's gonna go or here's where it's not gonna go. Um, And it's kind of understanding the, uh, if you're going to go into, and you know, this is something that's, I'm not somebody who's often on the front lines. Uh, Other people do that far more and I'm always cautious to classify myself as an activist as a result. I work with activists and try to help where I can, but other people are often doing the frontline work. And it's the question of what are you willing to do and take as a result and what are the risks that are you're willing to think about and that work for you because it takes all parts in order to make this work it's rare that one person will do it and it's kind of understanding where that goes and then the cause lawyer has to understand where do where can you support and where can you fit um and and what's the way to do it because it's never and the cause lawyers i've talked to understand it's not about them it's about how do you help the other people in order to move something forward and it's that question of of how to do that the the typical uh, answers are when we go, uh, when lawyers go to a political science conference, they always are uh, challenged by saying, oh, uh, the fact that you, if you litigate, you depoliticize. Yeah. You're, you know, you're preventing the, the group uh, uh, from going and arguing for itself. It delegates to experts that are lawyers, and therefore there's a loss. And those are legitimate uh, concerns. Mm-hmm. But there's ways to do it without doing that. 
right? Like it's the, the, the phrase that's come up in my research is that lawyers don't want to lead. They want to be on tap. They want to help where it makes sense. Do you work with the organizations and do you talk to the community to find out what are the ways that you can actually help? What are the broader connections that you're doing in order to go? Where is their support? Does this actually work or does this help or does this not help? Because the community often knows what they see as the biggest priorities and what they see are the things that they need to do and that they want to work on. And this is the thing about lawyers who are working to do systemic change. And that was the focus of my research particularly is lawyers who are particularly looking to do social change for my definition of cause lawyering uh, and the people I was looking at, they recognize that it's not just about them as experts. They are a tool in the toolkit. Mm -hmm. The question is, are they the right tool and can they be used and leveraged in a way that actually helps? Um, or that you at least understand what are the consequences of if you use this tool and where it doesn't go or how can it be leveraged in other ways. So uh, I, I want to bring the two other, do you feel you're the right tool? <laughs> Murray, you've, you've, you've been in that position of imagining your work. So what's, uh, uh, does, does what Basil say uh, uh, resonate with your own experience? Well, uh, Basil says that people like me are just a tool in the toolbox. So, you know, uh, and maybe Basil is the carpenter. He'll, he says, no, Murray, don't do it that way. You're, you're, you're acting like a screwdriver. You need to act like a saw or something like that. I say, I say jokingly, but no, Basil's right. And uh, I, I guess I would consider myself a cause lawyer, perhaps. Um, but uh, it is, it is uh, fundamental to line up one's to choose one's cases and to line them up both with the uh, you know in terms of the people you're working for and in, and even the legal doctrines you use and so um you know uh for example in uh uh in in the Ipperwash case we sued for eight years and we sued you know the premier of ontario personally and the province and everybody well, that was framed as a negligence lawsuit, the doctrine of negligence. And in, in the case against uh, the mining company is, an, is, a, is a tort claim in negligence. But at the same time, there are many ways to, to work closely with your clients to, to make it real, take it out of a realm of a doctrine and, and fit it to real life and have people agree with what is, is, is happening and going on. Uh, but you have to talk with the client's uh, all the time, so they understand what's going on. You have to listen to them, and if if it's not appropriate that it be litigated, then don't litigate it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what you say about depoliticizing things is is very real. Um, and and it, it, you know, and as Basil says, you know, cause lawyers have to say it's not all about me. And if this isn't the way to do it, then I'm not going to do it. That must be a question that arises at CCLA often about. Uh, is it, uh, do we uh, intervene, not intervene? What's the role of CCLA, which uh, case? In, any reflection on that? Uh, you know. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think that it is always a question of, um, I mean, for us as an organization, because we're small um, and have a small staff and limited resources, we, we do have to make decisions about, you know, how to prioritize things. I think with, um, with activists, the really important role that we hopefully can play is around education, public education about your rights so that people understand, you know, what they, so that, you know, Mr. Figueres understands that he doesn't have to submit to a search uh, walking down the street. Um, and, um, you know, we encourage people to assert their rights in a way that's polite and um, non-combative, but, um, but to assert them and where they're violated to, um, you know, to figure out what are the mechanisms to, to pursue to Mm -hmm. um, to get some sort of recourse, even if it's not, you know, not for personal gain, it's it's more for for the principle. So, um, I think that's a lot of what we're what we're doing, and and it's, you know, I'm I'm not sure that I would characterize myself as a cause lawyer only because, um, uh, uh, unless you sort of think of civil liberties broadly as a cause, but I think that what we're trying to do is to promote the rights that assist people in pursuing a whole variety of different causes mm -hmm. um, and and ultimately hold the government accountable for, you know, for overreaching or overstepping in, in a whole variety of circumstances. So we're coming to the end of our, uh, of our talk, of our dialogue. So I'm just going to ask you all of you. So uh, what should we remember from the 
this dialogue and from its, the, the, the lessons of 10 years ago of the G20. Uh, let's start with you, Basil. What's, what, what should the, the people that have listened to remember from today? What's your key message? There's a lot, but I think the, I think the biggest thing is to remember that uh, uh, think through what is the best thing for you and what is the best way in order to accomplish your message and try to think of it as part of the multi-pronged strategy as to what is the best thing to do. It, it, it's not going to be uh, what there, there's not always one solution. It, might, it often is different ways to do that. And then kind of recognize the realities of what works best for you, particularly in a protest situation for depending on what works for your personal context and the realities of it. And because uh, if your personal situation is, is that you have kids that affects what you're the risks you're willing to do. Um, if you are, if you personally are very passionate about it, it might be other things that come in. Are you willing to run the risk of uh, where, where do those, how far do your principles go and what, what are the consequences you're willing to do when you think that through? Because just because you have the rights, you may not, they may not be respected at the time. And I think that's part of the context to kind of think through what works for you and what is the, what is safe and what is best for you as a result when you think things through. What about you, Murray? Well, the topic is G20. 10 years later, and, and all of us have been working on different parts of it. And by the way, Natalie, I'd be interested in your view of this, but uh, it, it's been 10 years. And, um, you know, my little niche is I've been litigating this case for, for 10 years, along with many other lawyers who were fundamentally important to this. And um, it hasn't been easy. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, we recently calculated our, our two law firms spend more than 7,000 hours of lawyers' time on this case. Uh, with almost no pay. It has not been easy. So the question is, is it worth it? W what is one accomplishing? And I, I think one needs to, and I do try and do this, look at the big picture in terms of history and globally. And what we, what we have in Canada here, I think, despite me being often very cynical and me seeing a thousand imperfections in the legal system, is we've got something here that's pretty special in some way. And merely the fact that we can sue the police for 10 years, and again, I'm optimistic there'll be a good result. Um, you know, this is all pretty fragile, and uh, lots of other places in the world uh, have nothing close to what we have. In history, lots of people have nothing close to what we have. So uh, I don't want to sound all Pollyannish, but, um, you know, fighting for 10 years to uh, have some police reform or some restrictions, you know, that may be an important thing to do and a really good thing to do. What about you, Kara? Your uh, final reflections on uh, uh, 10 years later, what do you want the public to remember? Um, I think, I, I mean, I do want people to remember that this happened, that this can happen in Canada, that we can have, you know, um, peaceful protesters locked up in a detention facility um, and um, and that it can take 10 years or more to get any sort of recourse for that. So I think it's important to remember. I do think that, that we've definitely, and I, I think police have, have learned lessons, but I, like I said at the, at the outset, I think it's, it's taken time and it's, um, you know, it's not finished. We're not, we're not done. So I want to thank you all for, uh, for this. I think we, we had wanted to do something on, on the, on, on the G20 to illustrate the vigilance that continues to be necessary and to see the connection to the current protest and how important it, it, it's to know where this right comes from, how important it is. So thank you very much for uh, helping us understand uh, the nature of the right to protest and its importance in, in, in our thank democracy. You. So thank you very much. This is the dialogue for uh, this year for uh, uh, Massey College. I think we will uh, come back uh, probably in September uh, with, uh, and I encourage everybody to continue to submit suggestions, ideas, uh, much more work to do. I think uh, Massey really wants to be part of a reinvention of itself in the context of anti-black racism this is an instrument of it, and I want people to feel very uh, empowered to continue to, uh, to, to send their ideas and suggestions. Merci beaucoup. Thank you to our staff that is doing that uh, since uh, 
COVID started uh, in, in March. Uh, thank you so much for having been there to uh, Matt and Abra uh, to, uh, you know, help us deliver uh, some, some intellectual content to the community uh, every week. Merci. Thank you.